if you listen to today, today's discussion, what you will not hear, except for one reference by Edward Drea, the name of the emperor, not one. Of them. Which I consider to be one of the grandest deceptions. My topic is the Axis Alliance, the Grand Deception. The history of Japan in the run-up to World War II and after is fundamentally distorted. It's distorted by the characterization of the emperor as an innocent class and not the central figure of Japanese strategy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had some water up here before. <clears throat> but the origin of the idea of Hero as, a, as an innocent bystander came after World War II when American and Japanese leaders reached a compromise. The Japanese wanted to maintain the emperor and we wanted to carry out a peaceful occupation. And so we resurrected the idea of the pre-Meiji era notion of the shogun, indirect rule through uh, the puppet emperor. That mm, resulted in numerous histories of Japan that characterized the emperor as a non-entity. And the result was most of Japanese history has been fictionalized as a result. All of the military histories consign Hirohito to bystander status, not the grand strategist that I consider him to be. The idea of Hirohito as a, an innocent bystander began to crumble as Japanese sources emerged to, to uh, dispute it, especially the Kido Diaries, the Sukayama Memorandum. And that produced other account works by Edward Baer and Herbert Bix, Paul Manning, and David Bergamini that showed that the emperor was in fact the grand strategist for Japan from at least 1936. if not 1926, when he came into power. And while showing that, they have not taken it to the next step to analyze the nature of the access relationship that resulted, nor the nature of Japanese strategy. And that's my topic for today. Sun Tzu said that all war is based on deception. Von Clausewitz said that war is an extension of politics by other means. The conclusion of that syllogism is that all wartime politics is based upon deception. So what I propose to do today is to look at the axis alliance when it was forged in 1936 and when it was forcefully destroyed in 1942, from 36 to 42. What I'll show in treating Hitler and Hirohito as leaders who decide, what I hope to show is that Hirohito was responsible directly for the attack on Pearl Harbor. But he was indirectly responsible for the outbreak of World War II, and also indirectly responsible for the survival of the Soviet Union in World War II. Now let me give you a couple of ground rules. A couple of points I want to make. First is that Leaders determine strategy, not theater commanders or bureaucrats. I don't want to take anything away from the factions in Japan or in Germany or elsewhere. 
There was the Go North faction, the Go South faction, Guangdong Army, the Korea Army. They all existed. They all had their voice. But it was the emperor who decided, just as it was Hitler who decided. <clears throat> the second point I want to make is that the scale of their enterprise was vast and global. It made their complementary actions difficult to discern. It's a lot easier to find local explanations for what was being done. The third is that the Germans and the Japanese were in continuous discussion from the early 30s on despite frequent periods of time when it was claimed that their relationship had fallen apart. That was part of the deception. <clears throat> the anti common Pact of 1936, the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 39, the Tripartite Pact of 1940, were just the tactical public expressions of a strategy in play, not the strategy itself. They were parts of efforts to deceive adversaries. Fourth, deception, I maintain, was the essence of the German-Japanese collaboration. And the failure to understand how it was practiced or whether it was practiced at all makes it impossible to understand how it functioned. Obviously, fifth, their, their alliance failed. But that should not obscure the fact that they had one. So what was the Axis strategy? The Axis strategy was for each power to build a forward launch pad for an invasion of the Soviet Union, to build then a defense perimeter to avoid becoming entangled in a two-front war, and then to attack. It's a strategy that had to operate over time it couldn't happen all in one swell foot. And that's what makes it difficult to analyze that they had ultimate objectives. Besides, their strategies were asymmetrical. Hirohito already had his forward base in Manchukuo, but Hitler had yet to build his, and neither had yet constructed a defense perimeter. But that would occur over time in, in relatively, historically speaking, a relatively brief period. But in practice, it meant that Hitler would take the lead in this, and Hirohito would follow, supporting his lead as the tactical needs of Japan permitted. So Hitler and Hirohito began to discuss the possibilities of an alliance as early as 1933. But it was not until 1935 that they got serious about it. Their, their efforts would produce the anti commentary pact in uh, the fall of 1936. But those negotiations became known to Stalin. And Stalin put in place, very quickly, a counter strike. One of the things I want you to understand about, about Hitler, Stalin, and Hirohito is that each one of them faced a potential two-front conflict war. And it was their concerted effort to try to put their adversary in that two-front conflict war while evading it, avoiding it themselves. And so Stalin. By 1935, had pursued a strategy of collective security, had defense pacts with Czechoslovakia and France. And in the Seventh Comintern Congress of 1935, changed strategy completely from isolationism to engagement. In the Seventh Comintern Congress called upon the communist parties of the world to be ready to join in popular front governments wherever they could be formed. And as it turned out, there would be three. There would be a popular front government in France, one in Spain, and one in China. 
only we called the Second United Front in China. Stalin's objective, of course, was to divert the Germans and the Japanese away from Soviet borders. He was going to try to avoid becoming entangled in a two-front conflict war by doing that. And for a time, it seemed that he was succeeding. The war in Spain and the Sino-Japanese war diverted Japan and Germany away from any concerted effort to build a, uh, 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 to put Soviet Union in two-front war. But by 1936, they had formed the Anti-Comintern Pact. And in doing so, the pact showed the differences in approach by Hitler and Hirohito. Although the Anti-Comintern Pact was a quiet declaration of war against the Soviet Union, the pact itself did not name the Soviet Union. It simply named international communism. Even though everybody knew that international communism meant the Soviet Union. The reason for that was because of Hitler's and Hirohito's differing approaches to alliance. Hitler would repeatedly call for an openly declared alliance relationship. Hirohito wanted nothing to do with that. He wanted their alliance to exist, but to remain secret. The compromise of the anti confrontation pact was that they would identify the target, but not clearly. Well, we, and we would find this difference in approach persist over the next several years, with Hitler promoting the idea of an open alliance, Hirohito saying, no, let's cool it, we'll, we'll, we'll keep our relationship secret, but I'll still support you. <clears throat> the truth of the matter is that in practice, they would adopt Hirohito's approach. So when we look at this strategy of theirs, first building a forward launch pad, then a defense perimeter, and then attacking, you, you understand what I'm talking about. For, for Hitler, the forward launch pad, of course, is Western Pole. The defense perimeter first is going to be what was called the Siegfried Line, the paralleling the Maginot Line, the French-German border. Later, it would become the Atlantic Wall, designed to defend against entanglement in a two-front war. For Hirohito, it's a more complex problem. He's got the forward launch pad. But his defense perimeter is vast, the vast Pacific. And it's going to take time and effort to build that defense perimeter. You may know that there are lots of references to Japan's defense perimeter. Oh, good. That's it. <clears throat> At the center of this effort is the need to isolate and immobilize the Soviet Union. And it wouldn't be easy because the Soviet Union has defense relationships now with the Western power, has a defense relationship with John Kaiser. So the question is going to have to be how to mobilize the Soviet Union while each achieves its forward launch pad and defense perimeter before commencing the attack. Now, we know that never ultimately transpired. The Japanese never did attack the Soviet Union, but not for lack of trying. That would be the FDR's doing, preventing the Japanese from completing their strategic advance. By the <clears throat> end of 1937, Stalin's strategy of trying to divert the Germans and the Japanese away from Soviet borders had run its course. 
Hitler was now ready to move east. He'd already taken the Rhineland and begun to build the Siegfried Line, as I'm pointing out. And now was ready to, to take a, uh, an advance to, into Czechoslovakia and Austria. The uh, Hossbach Memorandum describes that in late 1937. <clears throat> Hitler knew that Britain and France were divided. Edward VIII in 1936 was actually sympathetic to Hitler. So he offered no resistance to Hitler's movement. But he also knew that France, even though very powerful, was disinclined to take any offensive action beyond the Maginot Line. And so his problem really in moving east is how to neutralize Stalin. So in the spring of 1938, as Hitler begins to talk about the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia, he needs to be able to neutralize Stalin, who has a defense treaty with Czechoslovakia. And how to do it? The way they decided to do it was that Hirohito would create a diversion in the east. This would be the battle of Chang Bung or Lake Hassan, from, for five weeks in the middle of 1938, during the time when <laughs> Hitler was negotiating with Western powers <clears throat> over Czechoslovakia. As you know, Stalin was immobilized. He did nothing to interfere with, with Hitler's acquisition of uh, the Czechs at, uh, at Munich. <clears throat> at the same time, Hirohito is beginning to make his defense perimeter too by late 1938, the, the Japanese have secured control of Cantonment. thus interrupting partially supply line from Indochina to Chiang Kai-shek. <coughs> and in early 1939, Japanese secured Taiwan, uh, Hainan Island, and the Spratly Islands, all part of the growing defense perimeter that he's trying to build. In early 1939, Hitler has thrown off the, the, the shackles of Munich and acquired the remaining two provinces of Moravia and, and Bohemia in Czechoslovakia. The significance of that that those two provinces contain the armament works of Skoda and Burnham. So Hitler tripled the size of his military forces in a few weeks. And having done that, he was now prepared to look at building his forward launch pad in Poland. <clears throat> now, complicated business because all of the powers here are, have relationships, security relationships among themselves. England, France, Czechoslovakia, Soviet Union. The question is, how do you immobilize the Soviet Union while you move into Poland? Hitler's first approach is the direct one to Joseph Beck, and he wants to gain access across Poland, if Beck will permit it, but he won't. Ironically, at the same time, Stalin is negotiating with Beck for the same thing. He wants access to Poland in case the Germans come. Beck declines that too. Instead, he makes the fateful choice of adopting the security guarantees of Britain and France. Well, once he does that, Hitler knows that he has to use force. And if he's going to use force, he's got to be able to, 
to deter Stalin from defeating his government. And so his idea is, first, to transform the anti turn pact into a tripartite pact with Italy. But once again, Hirohito says, no, that's not the way to do it. On April 24, 1939, Hirohito tells Eugen Ott, the German ambassador, that, quote, we are with you with a full military alliance, but with two provisions. The first provision is, we want to keep our alliance secret. And the second provision is, once the war breaks out, we will not immediately join in the war, but we will only do so once we have built our defense perimeter, what they called the co-prosperity sphere. Hitler was outraged, but he shortly came to realize that this was the way to go. And Hirohito was going to help. As Stalin indicated his interest in a deal with Hitler, the interest was expressed by Molotov at the end of, in two ways, one at a time. Uh, first of all, Stalin expressed his interest by removing Litvinov, who was the uh, personification of collective security, and replace him with Molotov. And then at, in, at the end of May, while battles are going on in Oman Han, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, Molotov said, we will defend the borders of Outer Mongolia as if they were our own borders. That was a signal to Hitler about hope. Well, Stalin could have said, we will defend the Polish borders in the same way that we're going to defend the Outer Mongolian borders. Because the Soviets were pretty strong. But he didn't say that. He could have provided arms to Spain, the way he provided arms to the Republicans in Spain. But he didn't do that. Instead, his decision was to strike a deal with Hitler over Poland, rather than seek to guarantee Poland security by striking a deal with Britain and France. And in the process, as those secret negotiations got underway, under the cover of economic negotiations, Hirohito played a crucial role. From early May, he instructed Prince Cannon out of his family to start a border war with the Soviets at Noman. So for four months, involving several hundred thousand troops, tanks, planes, poison gas, furious battles at Moma, oh no, my not. Those battles convinced Stalin that he'd better make the deal with Hitler to try to keep the Germans and the Japanese apart. So it's untrue that the Nazi-Soviet pact was something, was an outrage to Hirohito. It may have been an outrage to some Japanese functionary who weren't privy to Hirohito's strategy. But Hirohito played a crucial role in enabling that pact, which of course meant the beginning of World War II. The Nazi-Soviet pact gave both of them short-term advantage. For Stalin, he was willing to trade his failed collective security structure and the international communist movement for some space and time. Eastern Poland, Estonia, Latvia, sphere of influence over Finland, Bessarabia. For Hitler, on the other hand, he got an immediate launch pad Western Poland, or an attack against the Soviet Union in the future, and a buffer zone that would enable him to swerve and build his defense perimeter on the Atlantic Wall.
Stalin, of course, immediately invaded Finland. A disaster performance by the Red Army. They lost over 300,000 uh, dead and, <coughs> and wounded in a three and a half month war. But he achieved his objectives, building a, his own little uh, defense buffer zone in the north. After the phony war, as Hitler invaded the Low Countries and France, within five weeks, it had control of the mainland European continent and began building his Atlantic Wall. There was never a chance that Hitler was going to invade Great Britain. Never a chance. Politically, he hoped they could get Edward VIII back in, in as king, which would neutralize England. If not, he hoped to neutralize England by submarine warfare, air control, control of air. There was no chance that he was going to put substantial portions of his army in an amphibious attempt to seize the islands and leave Germany vulnerable to attack by the Soviet Union. No chance. Furthermore, if we were going to attack the United Kingdom, he certainly would not have allowed the British Expeditionary Army of 330,000 troops to have left Dunkirk. That is a complete contradiction. His idea was to pursue <clears throat> Operation Sea Lion. For Stalin, of course, the invasion of France was not a surprise. But the weak response by the French shocked him. Because in only five weeks, the dreaded two-front war danger has reared its ugly head again. And now Stalin has to get out of that. The two-front war danger becomes manifest now as the Japanese, the Germans, and the Italians negotiate a tripartite pact. So much for the idea that Hirohito was outraged by the Nazi Soviet. The curious thing about the tripartite pact is that although it aligned the three powers publicly for the first time, it still left the object of the pact obscure. Some thought that it was directed against the United States. Others thought it was directed against the Soviet Union. It was, in fact, directed against both. And it was to fulfill Hirohito's needs. So, if you step back for a moment and look at this, by late 1940, Hitler has built his forward launch pad and his defense. Hirohito has his forward launch pad, not fully staffed, but in, in being, and he has partially built his defense perimeter. What occurs in late 1940 is maybe one of the grandest deceptions of all time. As the Germans, the Italians, Japanese sit down with Stalin and begin to carve up the world around them. At the very moment that Hitler is signing the orders for Barbaros, December the 18th, 1940.
Stalin's intelligence services did not tell him that war was coming. The 300 German supply trains a day heading for both left no doubt about it. For Stalin, the two-front problem presents itself again, and he needs to try to get out of it. Now, he will turn to Hirohito, and Hirohito is receptive because he wants to build his defense room. <clears throat> There's a myth about the Soviet-Japanese neutrality treaty. And the myth is that it was Hirohito's payback for the Nazi-Soviet pact. You've seen that many times. In truth, it's something else. Stalin's trying to avoid the two-front war problem. And Hirohito wants to reassure him that he will not be entangled in it. Hirohito knows that Hitler is going to attack the Soviet Union. He knows it from, if not from watching the trains, he knows it from Hitler and Ribbentrop telling Oshima that uh, they're going to attack. So he knows it before. He signs the Soviet Neutrality Pact. Therefore, it cannot be true that he signs the pact in order to build a defense position in the north while he goes south. There is no possibility that the Soviet Union is going to invade Manchuria while Germany is invading the Soviet Union. None. What has to happen here in the neutrality treaty is Hirohito's reassurance that Japan will not join in the attack on the Soviet Union with Germany. And he knows that's coming. And that reassurance is absolutely necessary because after signing the neutrality treaty, Hirohito will almost double the number of troops in Manchuria from 400,000 to 750,000. The real effect of the treaty and the deployment was to persuade Stalin to keep his Siberian forces in uh, Siberia and not move them quickly to defend against the anticipated attack by Hitler. Got that? This is pretty complicated stuff. <clears throat> so Hitler attacked June 22nd, 1941, 149 divisions, 3,350 tanks, 2,770 aircraft. The attack triggered responses across the board, but especially in Tokyo. Because the question now arose as to what Hirohito should do. Matsuoka, the foreign minister, who had just negotiated the neutrality treaty with Stalin, says, no, let's drop it. Let's drop the whole idea. Let's attack right now. We don't need a defense perimeter. We can attack, and together we can destroy communism forever. That battle. That battle raged for three weeks. But on the 2nd of July, before they got rid of Matsuoka on the 15th, Hirohito issued his decision. The decision was threefold. We're going to stick with the plan. We're going to build the defense perimeter, the co-prosperity sphere. If the British and the Americans get in the way, there'll be war. As far as the German-Russian war is concerned, we will not join it now. It's exactly what Hirohito said in April of 1939. 
We will not join it right away, but we'll have to wait until conditions become more favorable to us. What that meant, conditions more favorable to us, was two things. If Moscow fell, or if Stalin began to move troops from Siberia to defend Moscow, Japan would immediately enter the war. So for the moment, in the middle of July, Hirohito decides to stick with the plan rather than jump in. I think that was his biggest mistake. There was no possibility that the United States could get into that war to deter Hirohito. The United States has five divisions at this point in 1941. But FDR does become active. So a big mistake by, I think they could have brought the Russians down. But FDR does become active after June 22, 1941. Not only does he freeze Japanese assets, cut off the oil, shut down the Panama Canal to their use, reverse policy toward the Philippines. As you know, the Philippines was written off in, early, in all the early plans. Now he decides to defend the Philippines. But he's not really defending the Philippines. Reactivating MacArthur, building a Philippine army. What he's really doing is putting B-17s into Clark Field to threaten the Japanese should they move into Manchuria. <clears throat> he also moves all of our submarines to Subi. And he sends the flying tigers into China some 330 planes. It's clear that Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union will determine Hirohito's decision for Pearl Harbor. By early October, Hitler is within 50 miles of Moscow. Stalin offers to settle, and Hitler says, nine. And when that happens, Stalin begins to evacuate Moscow, and he begins to move Siberian troops west. The two conditions that Hirohito has put forth for Japan's entry into the that day, the day after, Stalin began to evacuate Moscow. The Kanoi government resigned. Hirohito appointed Tojo. I, you should look at that, because this is the culmination of a several months long policy by, by Hirohito of taking the royal family out of decision making roles and replacing them with military men. Here, uh, Tojo does a, a review. And by early November, 5th of November, Imperial Conference, <laughs> by the way, Hiro Hito couldn't really trust these guys, so he moved the Imperial Japanese headquarters and held all the uh, liaison conferences in the palace so he could watch them. <clears throat> but the decision that made here in early November, is that if the United States will not agree to the establishment of a Japanese defense perimeter diplomatically, then the Japanese will take it by force. That's Pearl Harbor. And a lot more. Meanwhile, in Europe, German forces had been bogged down in the rain, snow, and mud. But by the middle of November, the terrain had hardened. And the Germans began what they thought would be the final encirclement of Moscow. By November 24th, it seemed that Hitler's goal was in reach. And on that day, the first air fleet left Hippo Capo 1. 
the idea, as I see it, was for Hirohito to coordinate Japanese actions with the German advance so as to be ready to join the war once Moscow had fallen. The object, as I see it, of Hirohito's attacks was to destroy those weapon systems that could project power at great distances. There were two, the carriers at Pearl Harbor and the bombers in the Bay. The B-17s, especially the later models, could reach Nagasaki. That was imperative to knock out. If you're going to have a defense perimeter, you can't allow either the carriers or the bombers to exist. Now, FDR knew a lot of things, but he certainly knew that Japan had an extensive espionage presence in the Philippines and in Honolulu. And so he had to play his cards very carefully. He had to wait until the last minute to move those assets so that they could be safe uh, from attack. As I see it, FDR played a cat and mouse game with the Japanese over both the carriers and the bombers. As soon as the fleet departed Hippocampo FDR issued three orders. The first, break off negotiations. Secretary of State Hull would issue his 10-point memorandum, which the Japanese considered to be an ultimatum. Second, to send a war warning to all posts. And in the war warning, he said, Japanese must be allowed to strike the first blow. And third, he said, move the carriers and the bombers. Now the juxtaposition of these three orders alone with the departure of the fleet strongly suggests that FDR had more information at his disposal than we have given him credit for. Intelligence is complicated. But I think FDR knew a lot more than we give him credit for. Enterprise departed Pearl Harbor on the 28th, ostensibly on a delivery run of aircraft to uh, Wake Island, taking with him a dozen fast cruisers. He was supposed to come back on the 5th. Japan spy in Honolulu, Takashi Moramura, was reporting daily on the positioning of the ships at anchor in Pearl Harbor. Navy intelligence watching him carefully, intercepting his messages, reading his messages. But on the fifth, Enterprise does not return, claiming bad weather or the delay. On that day, Lexington leaves ostensibly on another milk run. And so both carriers are not going to be at Pearl Harbor. But Hirohito is committed. He gambles that they will be there by the time the planes arrive. So on the 2nd of December, he issues the climb Mount Nitaka order. And the attack is on. So when the attack occurs, the carriers are not there. Japanese, we've heard today how the Japanese were confused by it. How they didn't know what to do because their main objective was to hit the, hit the carriers and make sure they were hit, never to be recovered. But several dozen planes in the Philippines were unaccountable, still on the ground at Clark Air Base, nine hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor. A lot of controversy about why half of 17 of the 35 B-17 were still on the ground and not at Del Monte Plantation where they should have been, but we can go into that at another time.
The point is that FDR did try to move, the, move key assets, it seems to me, out of harm's way before the attack came. Sorry. Now, lest you, th uh, I think the Japanese made some very interesting decisions in the attack on Pearl Harbor. We've talked a little bit today about the Phantom Third Wave attack. We don't know whether it was going to be one or not, but if there was going to be one, it was canceled, I think, because they hadn't gotten the carriers. That Nagu Naguma wanted to conserve ammunition just in case the Kido Butai encountered the carriers on the way out. What's even more interesting is that you've seen the maps of Pearl Harbor today. What the Japanese did not strike were the 26 gigantic oil tanks right across the river from bay from, from, from Fort Island. What they did not strike was the Neosho, a fully loaded gas tanker between located anchored between Maryland and California. What they did not strike were the submarine pens. What they did not strike were the uh, repair facilities. Why? I think because they wanted to take Hawaii for themselves. Now, that sounds outlandish, doesn't it? Let me read you what General Marshall said to Franklin Delano Roosevelt on December 20th, two weeks after the attack. Marshall considered the Imperial Navy having seized control of the Mid-Pacific now free to operate directly against Hawaii. He considered it doubtful that Japan could overrun, overrun Oahu through amphibious landings, but without adequate defensive measures, other islands of the Hawaiian group could be taken easily. If they established bases on those other islands, he said, they could use air power to blockade Oahu and starve it out. But here on he declined to do it. And the question was, why? And the answer is, the carriers. Over the next six months, over the next six months, the Imperial Navy sought out the carriers, which were indeed roaming freely inside Japan's defense perimeter, striking targets of opportunity. So they sank the Langley off uh, Java on uh, February 27th. They conducted a, an unsuccessful sneak attack on Pearl Harbor with a couple of long-range float planes on March 1. They sent a six-carrier task force into the Indian Ocean to attack British assets at Trincomalee and Colombo, sinking the British carrier Hermes. During the Battle of the Coral Sea, they sank the Lexington, and they thought they sank Yorktown. They were wrong. In the meantime, FDR wanted, to, wanted Hirohito to understand that his defense perimeter was porous. That was the Doolittle Raid. The Doolittle Raid of April the 18th <coughs> took the Japanese by surprise. They could not figure out where it had originated. No bomber, uh, carrier-bomber combination had ever occurred before. No bombers had ever taken off from a carrier before. And so they searched the horizon to see where, where the bombers could have taken off from. And the two places they decided upon were, of course, Midway and Kiskanatu, both within one-way flight range of the beam. So, we reach a very critical moment here. It was at that moment that Hirohito is deciding to close the defense perimeter by taking Midway and 
and Kiska Natu and destroying the carriers that remain to boot, Hitler is asking him to do something very important. He says, extend your Indian Ocean fleet to Madagascar and disrupt the American supply line to the Soviet Union through the Persian Gulf. If you do that, you will have done more than you could do by deploying forces into Siberia. <clears throat> and Hirohito says, no, I want to complete the defense perimeter first. Well, we know how that worked out. <clears throat> It's the language. Yeah. The, the victory at Midway was more than a naval victory. It was a strategic victory. Because it meant that Japan would not be able to seal its defense perimeter, would not be able to join in the war uh, against the Soviet Union. They would, in fact, be relegated to one front wars. Both Hitler and Hirohito would be engaged with the United States and the Allies in one front conflicts. The rest, as they say, is history. Their strategy failed. <clears throat> but nevertheless, it's a remarkable enterprise that I think we ought to look more at 75 years later. Thank you. Now, if you don't have, have if you don't have questions about this, I'll be amazed. <laughs> I'm going to be amazed. All right, James. Now you're going to hear the other side of the story, as Dr. Perry will tell you about how how uh, Barbarossa affected FDR. Do you have a question? I, I, do have a question. Right. I would like to hear how. He's got the op he will have to choose among options, won't he? But what was it, assuming by what was it? Yes, I did. What was it that presented an effective interface between the two? For the longest period of time, it was the imperial family. So you had uh, Kanin, you had uh, Fushima, you had uh, Shigashikuni, you had uh, Kanoi, people who managed the bureaucracy, managed the debate within the bureaucracy, among the factions. And, and you know, he goes in it all the way. It's not true that he was distancing himself. He was in, in it. He managed it. Read Herbert Bix's account. He has some very interesting stuff describing exactly how Hirohito managed the bureaucracy. Fascinating stuff. Um, I think there's been a lot of things I the one thing I don't understand is if he was the main player on the Japanese side, why did he do such a bad job between coordinating the activities of the Japanese army and Navy? Well, that presumes he did a bad job. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course he does. <laughs> we all understand that. But I, I, th I find this period of time, 36 to 42, is one of the most uh, intricate, uh, complex interactions of how a state puts itself in a position to accomplish its objectives geopolitically, strategically, uh, and maneuvers his adversaries in that same, in, in the position he wants them to be in. And that requires deception of the highest degree. There was a time when, in the, in the fall of 1939, when Hirohito is 
deep in no man ha, and Hitler is disparaging him, and the Japanese as those those half lacquered uh, Asian uh, guys served now. All of that was a was a was a charade because it was designed to immobilize Stalin and draw Stalin. So that's what I find missing in the analysis. Is any idea that, that these guys would practice deception? You, you probably have seen it yourself. There's no, no discussion of deception at all. So from my point of view, Hero Hitler made two mistakes. He should have joined the war right away in, in July of 1941. And failing that, he should have extended his naval presence to Madagascar in the spring of 1942. Either one of those would have dramatically changed uh, the fate of the Soviet Union. And that's why I say Hirohito is responsible for the decision to strike Pearl Harbor, responsible for the outbreak of World War II in the first place, and as well as the survival of the Soviet Union. <coughs>